O heavenly King, the Comfort, Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, present in all places and filling all things, treasury of good things and giver of life, come and abide in us and cleanse us of every stain, and save our souls, O good one. Amen. Well, all right. Good evening, everyone. Welcome um, to our third meeting. Um, should be our fourth, but it's our third uh, of this spring version, part two of our uh, book study, our adult religious education uh, book study, where we are studying the book, Our Thoughts Determine Our Lives. This week, uh, we are going over chapter 10 in the book, which is on, which is titled on spiritual struggle. Um, I think that, uh, as we begin, um, we've said this over and over before, or I've said this over and over before that these chapters, um, really kind of mesh into each other well and. Um, a lot of what's said can be kind of identified with previous chapters that we've um, had. And a lot of the ideas are very similar. Um, and it kind of continues here, even, even from, you know, chapters eight and nine that we were discussing. And <clears throat> I'll start with some of my notes here uh, that I made on the various parts of chapter 10. And then we can go into uh, more of a discussion too. And, you know, I'll ask what you guys think um you know the number one there if we could start with uh kind of sets the tone for for the whole chapter and he says you know everything is constantly changing nothing remains static we perfect ourselves neither in good uh or in evil that kind of spoke to me because you know he's saying that um we're in this constant flux as human beings we uh, we neither perfect ourselves in good, but we also don't fully immerse ourselves uh, in evil or indulge in evil things, which is interesting. Um, he says nothing remains static. We're const- everything's constantly moving. Um, but then he immediately goes in number two, where I have like my first note here, um, and he's sort of reminding us that we we must learn how to live a heavenly life because you know as we were talking about last week we are um you know that's what we're called to do and we we're called to not live just this earthly life especially you know we're supposed to renounce the things of this world that the demons would have us spend all our time on so that we're distracted from the good things that we're supposed to attain for. And so he says, we must learn how to live a heavenly life. And I take this as we have to do that right here. Uh, We don't somehow get to the kingdom and learn it there. It's not in the sense of learning as we go kind of thing. We have to learn it here on earth, which tells us what? that earth was meant to be a heavenly place when it was created. And if we're supposed to learn how to live this life in heaven that we're supposed to uh, arrive at after our death, then we really have to treat our earthly life like our heavenly life will be. Of course, you know, this life is physical and it's tangible and we don't know uh, what our lives in the kingdom will be one day. We have these, like the fathers say, we have these foretastes of the kingdom, especially within the liturgy um, and within the Eucharist itself. Um, by partaking the body and blood of Christ, we partake of the divine. And where else can you say that you do that? Uh, you know, that's the only avenue where you partake of the divine within your body, within your temporal, physical body. Um and of course, you know, there, there are other sacraments too, uh, where, but that is the chief sacrament, you know, and that is um, where we kind of begin with learning how to live our heavenly life too. But here, what he's saying is in number two, <clears throat> um, is that, you know, we're constantly living 
in this state of resistance to that opposition to that um you know he 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 gives this example of a family man who uh who has a home and a family and who knows how to do his job well um but he's doing this job not because he wants to he's not doing this according to his like will he's he's doing it against his will actually um and then he you know he says how like this inner resistance builds up towards this almost resentment i would say um towards uh, these things that we don't want to do um and he says you know if we don't rid ourselves if we don't learn how to rid ourselves of this inner resistance to to the things that we must do um we won't be able to enter the kingdom of heaven and dwell among the angels and the saints and i have highlighted specifically right here this line uh within the first towards the end of the first paragraph for we have acquired the habit of always opposing one thing or another as there is always something against our will we have not learned to be obedient to the will of god but always want our will to be done and then he says well in that case there will be no place for us in heaven he says therefore let us be thankful to god for everything he knows why he has put us in the position where we find ourselves and here i have highlighted in a different color especially to emphasize we will get the most out of it when we learn to be humble and he finally says we should always remember that whatever task we perform here in this life is for him capital h god he gives it to us whether we are believers or not whether we're pious or not we must carry out god's plan how relevant is this to the pandemic to what we're going through we're in this habit of when things don't go according to our will and of course a pandemic is not according to any of our will none of us want a pandemic so naturally for us it's against our will we don't want it we don't want to deal with it and you know we've been dealing with it for almost a year um and the things that go along with it especially you know of course i'm alluding to like masks and distancing and all all these uncomfortable things that we're that we're having to do um but you know it's so relevant because because of what he says next we have to learn to be obedient to the will of god um he he puts us in the position where we find ourselves and not and we're not trying to say that you know god is the cause of the pandemic he simply allows this to happen right and he allows it to happen for us for some reason maybe unbeknownst to us to grow spiritually <clears throat> and to grow closer to each other and to him ultimately um you know in this situation that we're in that is most difficult we should be running to god at every opportunity we get but instead what are we doing we're on social media we're slandering each other there's the whole political aspect of things going on in our country uh, and i just you know it's we have to think i i'm just speaking in terms of what we are experiencing in our country there's a whole world out there that perhaps other countries are experiencing experiencing different difficulties that we don't even know and you think about things before the pandemic you know for example how difficult things in the middle east are and think of our brother our brother christians in the middle east how much more difficult could it be right now with this pandemic as well we don't know what situations they're going through and so we have to remember that you know everything comes from god in the mindset that he he's not the cause of of these things making us uncomfortable um but he allows them to happen for us to grow and for us to grow humble like he says here we get the most out of this situation when we learn how to be humble um i thought this was a really poignant section this number 2 uh and really relevant to how we should how we're probably feeling right now and and how we should be reacting to this um but of course you know in number 3 actually he he addresses this again and and this came up in the last chapter how he says the evil spirits are always wanting to interfere with whatever we're doing for our salvation so maybe we are 
thinking about this pandemic, not to dwell on it too long, but obviously it's taking up a big chunk of our lives. Not to, not to dwell on it too long, but maybe we are trying to learn how to be humble within the situation, but we're constantly being poked at, distracted by these evil spirits because they know that if we learn humility through this situation, through this literally most difficult situation for us as human beings, they know that we will grow towards our salvation. We will grow toward closer to God by finding this humility um, uh, in what we're experiencing. So, you know, there's that too. So it's like, you know, how much, how much can we handle? How much can we handle as human beings? And, you know, there's a part, there's a part of this chapter where he, he kind of says, I think he says, I think it's in this chapter where he says, um, you know, God gives us as much as we can handle. Um, and, and I think it's true. We have to, we shouldn't sell ourselves short as human beings. And, you know, the old adage that, oh, I'm only human, we're weak, or this, or that. I think it only goes so far. We have the strength. The strength is in our free will. We decide whether or not or how we're going to react to something. So, you know, it ultimately, if, if we want to attribute something to ourselves and something that we can do, because we always say, you know, give your difficulties to God or, or you know, uh, in a difficult situation, or if you're feeling weak, turn to God, of course, turn to God first. But if you want to know something that you can do is use your, your free will, using our free will in the proper way and uh, using it to make the decision to, to be humble instead of, you know, like all the things we said, the things on social media and the temptations of buying into those things and turning on our brother or sister in Christ um, and saying evil things. Because ultimately, those things only tear us further and further apart. Um, it tears communities apart. It tears uh, brothers and sisters apart, parents and children. You know, and um, the further we get, uh, not the more difficult the road, but, you know, the more we have to do to regain uh, what we're losing every time we do something like that. Uh, my next note is within number four. Let me see what it says. Um, so number four, uh, you know, he, he, uh, he's talking about how, you know, we, we know as human beings that, you know, the time is running out, you know, in the sense of like, you know, we are frail and, and eventually we're going to die. And he says, and the evil spirits know this too. And they don't want a single person to be free from evil thoughts, obviously, because if they're free from evil thoughts, they're, you know, going towards God and they're, you know, cl getting closer to theosis and being, and being, you know, in the old way, in the uh, cre way we were created. Um, and so he says with the aim that they, they teach even small children to oppose their parents so that when these children grow up, they will be easy prey for them. So, you know, saying that kind of the evil spirits prey on children, uh, so as to give this plant, this seed of rebellion in them, I guess you could say, uh, so that when they grow up, it's easy for them. It's easy for the evil spirits to kind of pick on these kinds of people who are already rebellious to what is godly. And, and, you know, in this sense, honoring their parents. Um, but of course, you know, we, we think of anyone who's been, who is a parent or knows, knows that, that uh, you know, we have to combat that as parents with prayer um, and keep those, those things away. And, you know, obviously we lose our temper and it means we need to work on our own prayer too. And our job is double. Our, the job is, is difficult. Um, but he says um, it, can it can all take a turn for the good if each one of us begins with ourselves. So what does that, what does that mean? And he's, I mean, you can say that he harps on this point, the entire book from the beginning is that we have to start with ourselves. Um, you know, and starting with ourselves means looking within ourselves uh, and daily, you know, humbling ourselves so that 
through our thoughts and through our actions. In this example, our children can learn the same good qualities, the same godly qualities. Um, and I, I have highlighted here this line where he says, a meek and humble person is always pleasant to be with for he emanates peace and warmth. Um, and I highlighted and wrote the note because it, it, it almost, it reminded me a little bit of uh, in the 50th Psalm where, um, where it says uh, a broken and humble heart, God will not despise. Uh, so we have to teach our, ch our children that we have to teach our children how to be humble and how to be even broken uh, so that we, we know that when we, when we, when we're, we are broken and when our heart is broken, we turn to God. And that is the first reflex because like the Psalm says, a broken and humble heart, God will not despise, meaning God will not turn away from someone who turns to him uh, in this sense of humility. Um, so he says, you know, if, if we all begin with ourselves, this transformation will take place. Um, and actually, Dimitri and Susan, you know, I, I was blessed to come to your house yesterday to, to do the blessing. And uh, we sat down and we were talking about this very thing. Like if we all started, if everyone had their own, you know, uh, self in mind, and improving themselves and their thoughts and things like that, how different would the world be right now and how different would these countries be? And even, you know, all the things going on in our country. So, um, you know, starting with ourselves is where, is where we can begin this, but, you know, with that in mind, we also think about this idea that he presents of this constant battle that we're in and this constant, um, um, poking and prodding that these evil spirits are doing to us in every moment of every day. Uh, so, you know, that, that's, it can be, it's a daunting task that we have and we literally fail every day. Um, but we also have, we have success sometimes every in every day. And that goes back to his point in number one, we perfect ourselves either in good or evil. You know, we find which, which, place uh, and it's a daily challenge and it's a you know every moment of every day that we have to remember let's see my uh my next note kind of shifts gears a little bit is in number seven <clears throat> uh where he's talking about fasting uh and i thought this was this was a nice you know point for this to be brought up because why in in one one month from you know Monday, uh, Great Lent starts, and we are preparing ourselves to fast. Um, of course, you know we're called to fast throughout the year during the week, um, but uh, you know we're getting ready for the Great Fast as we call it. Um, and he says here, you know, I have like the whole paragraph highlighted because it's really it's really beautiful. Um, the Holy Fathers, he says, the Holy Fathers have taught us how to fast. Um, those who are physically weak and, and sick do not need to fast. Of course, he brings up this kind of practical point. Um, but he says, we who are physically healthy, we have to prepare for communion by fasting. So he's not even talking about, you know, just Lent here. He's talking about in general, when we're getting ready to receive communion, both the day of, but also, you know, throughout the week before, we should be preparing ourselves for it, you know, in anticipation of this great thing that we are receiving, this great, the body and blood of our Lord. Um, and, you know, he says it means that we eat less and only certain kinds of food. Um, and this is where it kind of spoke to me about Lent, especially that he says, um, for by doing so, we discipline our bodies and our thoughts. You know, the Lenten fast is as much about our bodies as our souls. You know, a lot of times we'll focus on, uh, the spiritual side of things and say, you know, I want to pray more. I want to go to church more. Um, but it's equally as important to understand what we're putting in our bodies and how much we are feeding our bodies. Because look what he says here, when the body is humbled. So first of all, I don't know if you've ever th even thought of it this way, but fasting is humbling your body, right? You're, uh, you know, you're bringing it down to a, another level, to a simpler level. So we're humbling our body. I, I really love that thought of how he says that. When the body is humbled, our thoughts become more peaceful too, right? 
Lent is a time for slowing down, not doing more. Because why? We're, you know, notice in the liturgical life of the church during Lent, we don't have weekday liturgies. We have pre-sanctified liturgy so that the faithful can remain strong when they're limiting themselves from food. And that's the point, right? So we have pre-sanctified in the middle of the week so that the faithful can uh, retain their strength while they're going through this arduous fast physically and spiritually. Um, and so, you know, by, by fasting and by humbling our bodies, our thoughts become more peaceful too. Why? Because he says, this is the purpose of fasting. God is present in a mysterious way in every being, most especially in the heart, which is in the center of life. He says, it's impossible to unite with God when the stomach is full. For a full stomach causes many cares and worries, right? How true is that? If, you know, think about Thanksgiving, Christmas, the holidays, even like Saturday night. It's like you go out with friends or, you know, hey, we just we just had, you know, the food fest, the Super Bowl. And whether you had people over or you were just by yourselves, I mean, I could speak for myself. I made too much food for two adults and two children. Um you eat too much. And then what do you do? How do you feel? Oh, I can't do anything else right now. I have to go sit on the couch and complain for the next hour. And that's where my thoughts will lie for the next hour or so or more. And then it's like, oh, oh, oh. In Greek, we have the word parapona. It's just complaining. Like we're just sitting there complaining. So he's right. A full stomach causes a lot of cares and worries because then we go to our thoughts and we're like, oh man, I'm going to get fat. Oh, geez, I ate too much food today. You know, this, that, and our mind starts to wander and get away from, from this point. So he says, all our thoughts, all our emotions, and all our will must be concentrated. He says, when, when they are not, we're restless and we lose our peace. And that brings his... um. I think his big point here in this chapter is not losing this piece. And he's talked about it before. Um, But that is, you know, that's huge. Uh, And especially as we approach, approach this Lenten journey, you know, you have to think about like, okay, I'm going to compline on Mondays. I'm going to go to pre-sanctified on Wednesdays. I'm going to go to salutations on Fridays. You know, the first week of Lent, there's there's Saturday of Souls liturgy. There's Sunday. I'm going to be at church, you know, five or six days out of the seven-day week. But then if you're going and, you know, like eating a ton of food after Compline or something, or even like going out, we should be really focusing on during Lent staying home. and. <laughs> what have we been doing for the last year staying home? And so, you know, it's this year could feel a lot harder uh, to do those things. Um, But it's really a time to slow down and focus. Like he says here, our, our will must be concentrated during Lent. Our will should be concentrated on the finish line the finish line being the resurrection in this time period. Um, And that means by focusing on the resurrection from the beginning, because our minds often go to Holy Week and they often go to the things that kind of make us lament a little bit, you know, the crucifixion, the passion, those, those torturous moments when we think about them, but, you know, we have to keep the resurrection as the finish line, because that's ultimately um, where we're headed once we start the Lenten journey. And even now, if I was to tell you that for those of you who were with me last year for the, the, the class I did about the Sundays of Lent, especially uh, we've already set in motion the liturgical time period that leads up to Lent. Uh, Sunday was the Sunday of Zacchaeus. I tell people always that when I hear that gospel, when I see that that's the gospel, I know, and in my mind, a little alarm goes off and says, oh, Lent's coming in a few weeks. The Triodion starts in in a few weeks. Uh, You know, uh, the publican and the Pharisee, the prodigal son, those are all coming up. 
Um, and so I begin my, my kind of mental journey there. Uh, and I start to prepare myself for these things. And, you know, we are a church of preparation. We constantly prepare to prepare to prepare. So we prepare for this Lenten journey that's the, that's to begin. Lent itself is a preparation for the resurrection. Uh, and then Holy Week is even more so that concentrated preparation where we're spending more hours at church than not at church, probably, as clergy anyway. Um, so, you know, we have to make our efforts concentrated and remember that uh, the distractions will continue. But if we limit ourselves a little bit, especially, you know, you don't think of food that way, but I like the point that he brings here uh, with what we're eating, how much we're eating and, um, and what our, what our activities are as well um, beyond uh, the church services during this time. Um, so uh, it's seven o'clock. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll bring up one more of my points and then we can kind of turn it over to you. Uh, so from there, I skip down. Let me see if there's anything relevant that I was going to say here. Are there any questions so far while I just kind of collect my last few thoughts? None. Um, <clears throat> My next point, I kind of skipped down to number 14 from there. Um, what was my point? Okay. Um, it goes back to this kind of idea of Elder Thaddeus is talking about children again. And he starts by saying, you know, that children, when children are younger, uh, they usually pray to God uh, for their parents. And he says that because they're young, uh, they receive grace without any effort, really. Uh, he says later they, they are grown, and if God wills it, you know, they'll feel the joy and that state of blessedness, that like foretaste of the kingdom. Um, he says God allows this first spiritual awakening as, as young children. That's um, received without struggle on their part because they're, you know, they're innocent. Uh, so that later their souls will yearn after that joy and blessedness that they felt. Um, I found this interesting because it, it made me think, <laughs> bear with me when I say this, but it made me think of in the last chapter when, when he's talking about uh, the, the evil spirits and how they, uh, they remember what it was like to, to live in the grace of God and to live in his presence, literally in heaven as angels. Um, and the fact that they remember that and they twist it and make it, you know, that, um, what did I say last week? That, that kind of, uh, they make, they imitate what the true love of God is, but it's really fake. Um, but here he's kind of saying the opposite of that. So I'm not comparing children to evil spirits, obviously. I'm saying that um, when he says that their souls would yearn for the joy and blessedness they felt, Instead of like the evil spirits remembering that joy and blessedness of being in the presence of God, children rather will yearn for that. They'll want that more. We as human beings long for, um, uh, for that state of joy and blessedness. Um, and so, you know, he talks about, he kind of goes into this uh, same idea that, um, you know, the, uh, a, a soul that lives in this blessed state is is quiet and meek and, you know, all the things that he's kind of said before. Um, and he says, like, you know, this person is in a state of grace. No one can pr provoke them or, or bring them to anger. Things we've heard him say before. Um, and then he says, later, this person is expected to consciously reject evil. He must defeat all the enemies of his soul while in this life. 
which is what we're all called to do. Um, I think, I can't remember where, but he says that, you know, to, to learn how to reject evil truly, it takes a lifetime of struggle. It's not something that we learn overnight or simply do with one thing or one action. Um, it takes a long time. It takes a full life of do, of actually doing this thing of, of, you know, putting down the, the desires and the, um, the evil things that are surrounding us constantly. Um, but he talks about here how, again, he says, our enemies are not made of flesh and blood because if they were, we could hide from them or flee from them. But our spiritual enemies are everywhere. They suggest thoughts that are not rooted in love, chastity, goodness, and kindness. These noetic powers or demons who have different characters, just as we humans do, are constantly putting impure thoughts into our heads, telling us to abandon ourselves to bodily passions, to thievery, to malice and envy. And if we listen to their suggestions and carry them out, these passions will become second nature to us. How true. How true is it that, you know, people say that, you know, a sin, once it is repeated, it's a habit. Um, like he says here, if, if we listen to these suggestions, if we even entertain them, these passions will eventually become second nature to us. And there's a part. Um, oh, and the part I was mentioning is actually right here. He says, a lifetime of experience is, is needed to reject evil and turn towards goodness so that nothing in this world can lead us astray from the right path. He says, this is why St. Isaac the Syrian says, preserve your inner peace at all costs and do not trade it for anything in this world. You know, there's that, <clears throat> there's that old saying or that old idea that's been in movies, there have been movies about it and of you know selling your soul to the devil right you know it's been in countless hollywood movies or shows and all these different things and this is kind of what it reminds me here is like don't trade your soul for anything in this world your inner peace is what's in your soul is, is that grace that is in your soul and the holy spirit uh, and so don't trade it for anything in this world don't uh, let the things of this world seduce you to ignore your soul. You know, we have to upkeep, we have to, just like we clean our homes and we clean our cars and we take care of all of these earthly things that will perish, more so we need to take care of our soul, which will not perish, which will be us. I mean, it, it is us. It's what makes us live. And uh, how often do we clean that? You know, and, you know, we need more than a spring cleaning every year during Lent, uh, our souls need constant attention. Uh, so, you know, that's something that we really need to think about. Uh, I think there was a message in the chat. Let me just check. Becky says, could you comment about number six and about tears? Okay, uh, let me scroll up there and then I wanna open it up because it's just after seven, number six. Okay, number six. Uh, it says the seal of the Holy Spirit is in our heart, which bears fruit, the fruits of our life. Meekness, peace, a merciful heart, goodness, kindness, faith, and abstinence are some of the fruits of tears offered to Christ from the heart. The results of such tears are love of one's enemies and prayers offered up to the Lord for them. Tears give us strength to be joyful, even in times of great suffering and tribulation, and to look upon the sins of others as our own and repent for them. Tears make it possible for us to lay down our life for our brother. Um, what I take from this kind of is <clears throat> not, I don't know that I, I think of this as literal tears because of the way he describes this. Um, you know, he says that these things, uh, meekness, peace, a merciful heart, all those things um, are the fruits of tears offered to Christ from the heart. Like by doing things, by, by living in meekness or peace, uh, you know, or 
uh, having a merciful heart, being good, being kind, being faithful, um, are the things that are they are the fruits of the tears we offer. So the tears, meaning, or I take it to mean, um, like this true repentance or this true um, sense of prayer within our hearts and connection to God within our hearts. And so when when we do those things, we're able to be meek and peaceful and good and, and faithful and you know abstinent. So those are those things are all the results of what we offer to God, basically, through our prayer. So I, I take the tears to be like prayer. Um, you know, he says, tears give us the strength to be joyful, even in times of great suffering and tribulation. I mean, you, the, in all the places where he says tears here, I feel like you could replace it with the word prayer because it, it makes sense as far as I can tell. Um, you know, and then that last line, tears make it possible for us to lay down our life for our brother. Uh, it's also an idea, you know, if you're thinking about it literally like tears, tears are a liquid that leaves the body, right? Um, so maybe tears making it possible for us to lay down our life for our brother is kind of like emptying ourselves. Um, and only in, you know, becoming humble and emptying ourselves can we lay down our life for our brother. Um, does anyone else have any thoughts on this? Uh, when I see things like this, some of the tears and stuff, I keep thinking about Christ at the um, uh, at Lazarus, the tomb of Lazarus, uh, where he prayed. And the first thing he did was he shed tears. And it always impresses me because he's God. He knows what he's going to do. He knows what's going to happen next. But he felt compassion and uh, he showed it in the form of tears. And it was part of his prayer mm -hmm. to God. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, like you said, it's his compassion for his friend. Lazarus was his friend. Uh, and it also, you know, speaking to that, I mean, it also uh, tells us, you know, and that being written in scripture, even more so, you know, makes the theology of the ecumenical councils uh, on the divinity and the humanity of Christ, you know, even more so, you know, would, would God, would, you know, would God cry in this sense? You know what I mean? Like if he was not a human, would he have cried? Uh, so we, and we don't know. So, you know, that's an interesting point. Um, but that's a good observation right there. Anyone else on this point? Becky, what do you think about this? If I may ask. I don't know if Becky's there. Father, I have a quick question about the tears. Yes. Um, so he talks about tears. I kind of getting the feeling as like a, a joyful, like a joyful kind of tear, repentful, repenting. So how would you explain tears that come from, well, I guess, I mean, that come from pain or like if we like fall down and get hurt or if somebody upsets us and we're upset and it's like a selfish kind of crying, like we're crying mm -hmm. over ourselves. How would you explain, how would you explain that? Or how would um, Elder Thaddeus like explain that? I know that's a little harder to do, but. Well, no, it's an interesting point. I mean, you know, like, like with all things, there's like, uh, you know, the, the sense of like r real, I don't know, real tears, like real, you know, like with anything else earthly, uh, you know, like for example, you know, we talked about love during that chapter on love about how, you know, there's this earthly love, um, that is kind of shallow and, um, is not at all for the most part is not how God loves or what God's love is like. Um, I think in the same way, like the, the tears, you know, like, we, we, we hear a lot of times the, the uh, repentance being uh, the tears of repentance being described as like true tears of true repentance. Like perhaps we cry when, when we go and confess 
Um, but if we cry about a certain sin that we have committed, and then we turn around right after our confession and go and do that sin again, were we truly repentful? Or were those tears of shame, perhaps? Or were those tears of embarrassment, perhaps? So I feel like there are these other categories or these other like sort of instances where we have tears, like you said, you know, if we fall down and we're in physical pain, we sometimes cry. Um, you know, we cry if we're hurt in other ways, if we're, you know, if we're sick, if we're, you know, if someone has cancer, they have pain and they cry many times. Um, so I don't know the definition of how we can, you know, differentiate these things. And I don't, I don't know that it's for us to differentiate. I think God knows the difference of, you know, what our true tears are, what are uh, the tears that he describes here that, that bring about um, a merciful heart and goodness and faith and all of those other um, positive aspects that he brings up in number six. So uh, I don't know if I answered your original question, but I think that, you know, it's up to God kind of what our tear. I, I mean, Tears are also just a physical reaction too, uh, that we are, that God created us with. And, you know, so, when you think about that, I mean, he says in, in number, I don't remember which one. And it's like right in the beginning, he says, humans were really a mystery. Like there's a lot, we don't even, know our own bodies. there's a lot, we don't, you know, understand. And it's anything to do. What purpose do they serve like why do why does you know tears have like saline in them why why you know why does this come out of our body first of all uh but also like who defined it as being something that is so connected to the emotional side of our being like did that just all of a sudden one day you know tears happened and somehow we feel it within us that it's something sad or something you know we know the difference sometimes when it's a happy tear, when it's a sad tear, but who defined this originally? How do we know this? I mean, it's, it's innate. It's something that is part of our instincts as human beings. Like, just like perhaps an animal knows, you know, what another animal is feeling because they don't communicate with words like we do. You know, we have this sort of sense of, you know, it's, it's brought about by the Holy spirit within us. Um, and we know, we, we somehow know when these things are, you know, happy or sad. And uh, it's still kind of a mystery, though. Like, why? Why is this the way that we express ourselves? I don't know. You know, if someone has an answer, let me know. But I think our, only our creator knows why he equipped us with this feature. Uh, if I was to put it in, you know, terms of technology or whatever. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I don't, I don't know if I can answer that any further, really. Thank you, Father. I think that was a very sufficient answer and it made me realize some things that I didn't, I hadn't thought about. Thank you. Okay. You know, you Father, that. in the index, if, in the back of the book, in the index, if you look at tears, he refers to them in many chapters, as uh, you'll see it's 76 on pages. But I just skimmed through them quickly, and I had them underlined. But uh, we might want to go back and revisit all his uh, thoughts about tears. They're quite interesting, mm -hmm. quite poignant. Let's put it that way. Yeah. Well, I find it interesting too. You know, um, when we're talking about this. Um, you know, number, number 17 in the chapter, right? It's like two sentences long. And he uses this word. I don't know if I'm going to pronounce it right or not, but it's a Greek word. Um, he says, our life on earth is like an epidemia, I think is how you uh, pronounce it. He says, don't be surprised that bad things happen all the time. This is like, if you don't look up the word, you're like, huh? Like, what do you mean? So, you know, in the back of the book, of course, it's, it's the footnote says that epidemia is a penance given to bring a soul to repentance and return it to health. So when thinking about these tears, then are tears something that are 
meant to help our soul return to health? You know, is that why when we confess and we are penitent about our sins, we cry? It's a healing sort of thing. I mean, how many times do we hear or say or whatever, you know, like, oh, I had a good cry about it and I feel so much better. You know what I mean? Like, or even like, think about kids. Kids cry about stuff and then they kind of calm down and they're better. Um, and sometimes, you know, our, it seems like our the relationship between our bodies and our souls, first of all, we have to think that they're out of whack. They're not in sync uh, like they're supposed to be. Our bodies and our souls are, you know, they're there together within our body, within ourselves. Um, but because of the fall, they're really out of sync. Um, the soul could be yearning for God constantly, but the body is constantly indulging in the flesh, uh, both, you know, with whatever, whatever sins, the food or, you know, whatever is tempting us on earth. So we're constantly this tug of war between our soul and our body. Um, and sometimes, you know, the soul indulges in those, in some of the evil and, and the sin. And the tug of war is, you know, pulled in one direction more and, and other times, you know, in, in the other direction. And we have discipline and all those things. Um, so uh, my point was that, uh, you know, we, we are given this life, uh, he, sa he says, uh, as a penance, uh, which is interesting because then we have to go back and think about creation and the fall again and say, well, God knew that this was going to happen, right? He created us. He knows everything. We have to think that he knew what we were going to do, which is a hard thought to think about because it's like, then why didn't he prevent it from happening? Well, he gave us free will. So that we could return to him. There's that saying, uh, if you love something, let it go. Uh, if it's true, it'll return or whatever. That's kind of like, you know, in rough terms, that's kind of like what God does. God loves uh, loved us or loves us. He created us. But he gave us that free will. Almost like to let us go. We made our mistake. But if we love God, if we love our creator, we have to go back to him. Um, and that's not to say that he's not helping us along the way the entire time. I mean, he sent his only begotten son just to give us the opportunity to be able to come back to him. So um, we have to think that, you know, we did something wrong. But we have to, like he says in previous chapters, like get up, dust ourselves off and go back to the grind and, and you know, try and return to God um, in simple terms, I guess. Father, um, you know how I, I read that same thing and I was going to bring it up. But when I read that, the first thing that came to my head when I read at the bottom, it meant a penance given to bring the soul to repentance is last year when we were not allowed or permitted because of COVID to come back to church. And I thought, you know, the, how we take everything for granted in life. And it was like, Oh, church is always there. So I skip a Sunday, I skip a weekday service or I'll skip, you know, we find things, but then it was taken away from us to the, where we were not permitted to attend and we weren't permitted, permitted to, to do anything. And I thought, I go, wow. I said, that's, that was like a huge penance where you sit back and you, you know, like think about it. It's like, wow, you know, something like that, you don't want to take for granted again, you know? And, mm -hmm. and when it said, don't be surprised, bad things happen all the time. It's like, you know, you, you think about things a lot differently when, when the main thing in your life is actually, you know, sort of taken away from you where you can't physically be in church. It's true. 
He he says, and if someone can find, I'm constantly remembering these things, and I don't, I don't remember which section they're in, but he even says in this chapter at one point, don't put off your salvation for tomorrow. Because like you said, you know, last year, you know, perhaps that last Sunday we had together, which I think was, I think I mentioned it to Dimitri and Susan yesterday, was Sunday of Orthodoxy. If we weren't there, if we said, oh, I'll be there next Sunday, you know, I'll be there during the week for the liturgy. If we weren't there and, oh, it's in number three. Um, thank you, Missy. Um, it's in number three. Uh, yeah, I mean, if if we um, didn't take advantage, we lost our opportunity there. And he's saying, don't, don't, you know, like he says here in number, th like in number three. Um, He said, you know, after I do all of these things, you know, like I haven't had all these experiences. If I, if I, if I, you know, after I do all of these things, I'll repent and, and God will, um, will forgive me and I'll walk in the straight path and blah, 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 blah. Um, he's saying, this is what exactly what e the evil spirits want us to do. They want us to put off our salvation until tomorrow or the day after or so on and so forth. And then God forbid, what if we do this our entire life? tomorrow, 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 next week, whatever. And then we die. We don't know when we're going to die. Not to be, you know, not to um, scare anyone or anything, but we have to be mindful of this. We have this one, one life and one great opportunity and one uh, gift that God has given us. We don't get to, uh, we don't get to have another chance. We're not cats. We don't have nine lives. Um, so we can't, put off any of this until tomorrow. We have to do it today um, because we don't know if we'll have tomorrow. We never know if we're gonna have tomorrow, you know? So um, it's the stark reality that we live in and, and, you know, with the pandemic even more so, you know, many of us lost that opportunity and, you know, um, and aren't getting it on a weekly basis or on the uh, whatever, you know, aren't getting to experience that. Father, um, as you're talking, it's bringing up some questions for me, um, mm -hmm. but I'm, I'm not Orthodox, I'm Catholic. So I, you know, apologize if this is like very elementary questions or um, perhaps you know, I don't want to waste other people's time. It might be common knowledge to everyone else. Um, oh, oh, thank you. You're kind. Thank you. Um, so um, I'm just thinking, you know, um, it, we talk about the spiritual struggle and we have the same idea in Catholicism. Um, the, the goal of our life is to become a saint and to struggle towards uh, holiness. But um, for us as Catholics, we feel like this purification process continues um, after death, so that this is the concept, as you know, of purgatory, um, which ultimately leads to heaven. As Orthodox, um, the, the state that you are in at the moment of your death, is that the state that you remain in eternally? Uh, as, as far as I know and have read, uh, that's n not exactly what we believe. Um, oh, okay. Because, I mean, because we we also kind of we don't have this idea of purgatory in the Orthodox Church, right? Um, but to be frank, and to be to sound kind of uh, simplistic myself, there's a lot of mystery there. Uh, we can say, what, I mean, we can say what we believe and yeah. what the Church believes and everything. Um, but ultimately, you know, it's still a mystery to us as well. Um, so you know, I, I would have to read it's, up it's a little bit really more in the realm that. of mystery. It's, yeah. I mean, we don't kind of believe in any certain place that we would go to, um, while we await, you know, the second coming and the final judgment. Um, you know, there are many tradition thoughts of schools of thought in tradition, um, you know, many people say that, uh, that the 
people will, you know, for the four, you know, because the 40 days are, are the first, the first 40 days after someone dies in the Orthodox church, there's a, the first memorial is done on 40 days. And then, you know, following that three, three months and, or one month, three, or, no, three months, six months, so on and so forth. Um, that the soul kind of goes here and there and, there are the the fathers say different things about it. Um, so I mean, ultimately, I don't know that there's one concise teaching. I would probably have to reference it and look. I don't want to give you the wrong answer. Oh yeah, it's okay. I appreciate that. And I think the one answer that you did give is is very good, which is it's a mystery, right? So there's there's a lot to this. It's not just a straightforward answer. And um, kind of just along these lines as well. Um, as we discuss spiritual struggle, and I'm actually kind of glad to hear it's not so black and white, um, but it, it, I'm thinking about salvation. Mm -hmm. And um, so like, I guess in some ways, like as Catholics, we sort of feel like a sense of assurance that mm -hmm. there is opportunity for further purification after death. Um, mm -hmm. so that we can, um, spend eternity with, with God, um, because we believe we have to be holy to be in the presence of his holiness. But, um, so as a, as an Orthodox, um, is there, like as Catholics, we would say, we hope for our salvation and that we are, um, we're here, we're working out our salvation here and, and that that's a process. Um, but there's certainly a sense of, um, you know, uh, like we, we can have some assurance, um, you know, follow the Ten Commandments and we can have some assurance and a reasonable hope to be saved. Um, mm -hmm. is, is this similar in orthodoxy or? Yeah, for the mo I mean, for the most part, and there's no, you know, as far as things kind of after, after someone uh, dies, you know, we pray for them constantly. Those who are living, you know, pray for the dead. Mm -hmm. um, we pray for the repose of their soul. We, we pray for the rest of their soul. You know, we pray that God um, takes their soul. Um, uh, I'm trying to think what else you were saying. Um, Just a sense of like confidence or assurance in your salvation. Yes. I mean, our, options. yeah, I mean, our, our, our confidence is in the resurrection, right? Because that is the basis of our, of our faith, you know, through the resurrection, but we also are <clears throat> working uh, towards our salvation here on earth um, through our faith and what we do, our works, faith and works. It's not one-sided on either sense. Um, you know, we're not, we're not in any sense, like, you know, perhaps the Protestant church or, or anything like that, that say, you know, when were you saved? Uh, which can be like a really confusing statement. Like, what do you mean? When was I saved? I'm still working that out. Like I'm still trying for that. Um, you know, but we also have this language like in our liturgy and things like that, that are like, you know, you came and saved us. Right. Yeah. When speaking to Christ. Um, and that's the idea of, you know, his divine, the divine plan of salvation that he carried out gives us that opportunity again to to attain salvation and to to i mean here's the thing he he did and it can be confusing i'm trying to kind of simplify it a little bit um he through his death and resurrection and abolishing death through that um he again gives us the opportunity because before anyone who died was going to hades before christ came and broke the gates basically and you know abolished death so he gives us this opportunity again through our free will uh to attain that blessedness that salvation again but we also have help along the way from him throughout our lives and baptism is like our first sense of uh you know we have these moments of the holy spirit being called upon us and being uh blessed by that holy spirit and that's why we have the sacraments and all of those various things to uplift us towards um that salvation and towards uh you know attaining that blessedness uh, of being with god uh 
and so it's you know it's it's a process so yes it's it's similar uh with some diff definitely with some differences right yeah thank you father and if that's just, an okay answer i hope it's a great answer thank you and you know it just it's i think the context of discussing spiritual struggle brought this up for me because i realized that as we were discussing it that i might be looking at it through a different lens mm -hmm. um and but yeah but this does this does clarify actually for me it, it the things are it's pretty similar but the spiritual struggle um and this these sort of purifications that we are sent in this life are for our salvation um but it's a little bit less defined it sounds like um for the orthodox mm -hmm. with what happens um immediately after death but um so there's not there's not a purification though that continues after death. That's I think that's Catholic. Mm -hmm. uh, no, and I mean we we have the we have the memorials so more for you know it's it's twofold. The memorials are, are both for the family of the person who who died as well as the person because we're also asking for Christ. You know we say for you are the resurrection, the life, and the repose of the name of the person uh so you know we're also praying for the soul we're constantly praying for the soul of the person and you know okay. uh the clergy you know the faithful write down names of the living and the dead for the clergy to commemorate at every service basically um and is the liturgy being offered uh, for those people or is it is that a separate I'm sorry. I, I should. It's, like, it's, no, it's okay. It's okay. It's it's part of the liturgy. Um, okay. Part of the liturgy is is also remembering the living and the dead. Um, and you know, of course, we can we can probably have a a full, fuller discussion of this, um, perhaps in person if you if you want, or on a Zoom call too. Um, and Father Andreas could probably join us too. Um, but in general, you know, yeah that's that's kind of what we do but thank you for those questions those are very good questions okay so it's uh it's seven thirty six. does anyone want to bring up any kind of final last point from this chapter i know there was a lot that we didn't really cover um but there was a lot that was very similar to to what we spoke about um uh, let's see if i have any oops, sorry any last few notes no go ahead it's okay lisa um, you have something so when the tears, the one with the tears, the little chapter, um, I don't know, maybe it's my personality. I saw a theme of tears. And then in 16, um, God loves us by giving us tribes and suffering and sorrow. So I was going kind of with a depressing <laughs> part of this and trying to make sense of it too. And um, 17 also, and then I think he continued even... 18 and then that kind of brought it together that then we're supposed to give our cares to god so it's almost like a test huh, not if we can handle it you know so much sadness and especially like with covid but that we are so that's like a, a test that we are supposed to give it to the lord and he's going to take care of us right? yeah i mean that's that's his that's, point that's is that's his point is, right as long as we're putting the effort in, God sees it. He's he doesn't he says he does right. not despise us, which is a very like uh, kind of the the word despise too is you know we hear it a lot in the Psalms and um and he says one day he'll give us the strength to free ourselves from our cares. You know, right. as he said like throughout this and, and as we say in the liturgy and many of the the priestly prayers um, and especially during the the two prayers before the take eat this is our this is my body and the drink of it all of you part um the prayer says that uh you know we're speaking or we the priests are kind of speaking to god through this prayer and saying you know you could not bear to see us under the tyranny of the devil uh and so you sent christ so on and so forth but that that is an interesting point there you couldn't bear to see us under the tyranny of the devil. Our creator has this compassion on us. Uh, and that speaks to this point that you're talking about in number 18, like one day he'll see us struggling to do this and he'll give us the strength 
to free ourselves sure. from these cares and from the, this part of the world, this uh, idea of the world. Um, but we have to, like he says, leave all of our cares to the Lord and, and leave our lives in the lives of our loved ones and all will be well. You know, going back to the pandemic, we have to leave all of this, all of these fears that we have to the Lord and he will take care of these things. We can't take care of these things. We, we can't, you know, and there's only so much that we can do um, biologically and physically and things like that. Um, we have to leave the rest up to the Lord ultimately because he's the like only the one. Statement to guard the peace in our hearts. That was a statement. And I think that was in a yeah, 20. Yeah, I like that. Peace yeah. should reign in our hearts. Yeah. And that was 20. And peace, yeah. you know, when you talk to, for me, peace, whenever I think of peace, I think of Christ after the resurrection, when he comes to, to the disciples. And what's the first thing he says to them? Peace be to you. And what is that peace? It's the Holy Spirit. And it's his presence. His presence there is the peace. Peace be with you. And anytime we say it in church, that's what I think of. We are in the presence of our Lord whenever we say things, things like that. And we have that peace. So if we have God in our hearts, like he says in the beginning of that love chapter, remember he says, having uh having God in our hearts is having love in our hearts. Uh, that is how we, we can move forward. And that's how we, that's how we have to live. We have to have that peace in our hearts. Good. Thank you. Anyone else before we um, yeah, wrap up? And we, yes, Jerry. It's just an announcement, a commercial. Yeah. Um, Father Andreas is out of town. Uh, so he won't be doing his class tomorrow night, but he will be doing it Thursday night. And uh, might as well tell you this too. <clears throat> the committee met and we, we're going to extend our program this year as we did last year. We're going to go into the summer. So we, we got a whole new group of, of uh, classes that we're working on. Even Father Nectarios has one. And uh, we'll, it'll be published uh, next week. Uh, and we're going to go through July. We'll break again like we did last time in August. Okay. That's the commercial for the day. That's the commercial brought to you by St. Nectarios Adult Religious Education. <laughs> Anyways, Catherine, did you have something to? Uh, yeah, uh, both this that we were talking about with um, having to kind of bend our wheel and constantly have to submit to things that we don't want to do. And a few other things that I've been reading and hearing about this week has made me remember um, a part of the book called The Theology of Illness um, by Jean-Claude Larcher. And in it, just at the beginning, before he even gets to the theology of illness part, he talks about how we have to understand that everything that God wills or permits to happen to us is to bring us back to him. To, not because we're bad, but because we need to constantly choose him. And that even things that we may define as evil, because we define evil as things that are uncomfortable or things that make us feel bad. And we define things as good as things that we like and things that we want to do. But God defines evil as anything that takes us from him. Mm -hmm. And anything good as anything that brings us back to him. And so just reading these different parts that the elder was talking about was like reinforcing that idea that like what he's permitting is giving us so many opportunities, whether it's something that's difficult for us or something that's not to, to choose him over not him. Right. And that's, that, that speaks really well to the point that he brings up both in this chapter and I think the last one too. He says, like, we're so, like, absorbed in our own will and, like, in ourselves that when these bad things happen, we get despondent about what's going on. And we're not realizing that we just need to turn to God. And that's what he wants us to do. And, you know, you think about people uh, and pray for people who are, you know, like atheists and believe that there's nothing beyond this earth. You know, how how depressing uh, to not believe that 
you know, there's something else. And the thing is our creator uh, and the person who wants to love us the most. So thank you. Those are, those are excellent. I'd like to look that book. I'd like to, can you send me the link to that book? Yes. If you can. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Anyone else before we wrap up? Father, I do have a, a question. Sure. Um, I just want to bring out just a, a couple of sentences. Um, one is in paragraph two. He says, therefore, let us be thankful for everything. And then in paragraph uh, 11, he says he, and he's talking about God. He is the one who determines our life. And we receive everything that comes to us as from his own hand. And then also in paragraph 15, I mean, almost the whole paragraph, but, you know, we must be prepared to accept the will of God. The Lord permits all sorts of things to happen to us contrary, contrary to our will. For if we always have it our way, we will not be prepared for the kingdom of heaven. Neither heaven nor earth will receive those who are self-willed. God has a, a divine plan for each one of us, and we must submit to his plan. We must accept life as it is given to us without asking, why me? We must know that nothing on earth or in heaven ever happens without the will of God or his permission. We must not become too engrossed with our hardships, but concentrate on uh, preserving our inner peace. Um, even if we're praying for something, we are trying to force our will instead of accepting God's. Our hardships and sorrows that God sends us are necessary for us, but we do not understand this when we are young. When we are older, then we understand that this is the way God shows his love for us. And this is a little bit of what Catherine was saying, but I just started thinking, that, I mean, if I believe that, if I truly believe all that I just said, my prayer life is going to be different. And, and I feel like that so many times we, or I, I, I pray for things that um, I either cannot control. Well, even God cannot maybe control because of, of we have free will. You know, that plays a part. But I'm almost, I don't know if this is right, but it's like in praying 95% of our prayer should be about praise and thanksgiving and just because I feel like if even if somebody is going through something and we're, you know, you want to pray for them, but God may be using that to bring him closer to himself. There's so much things going on behind the scenes we may not understand, but if we just pray, uh, prayers being of just praise and thanksgiving and just I don't know. Just I, don't, I struggle with prayer, and not sorry to pray, but how to pray in, mm -hmm. in, a, in a godly way, and, and that's something I struggle with. Of just uh, you know, it's the safe thing to do is just always just be thankful and, and praising God and everything. And then, as far as all these little uh, other things, I come from a Protestant background, and on Wednesday, a lot of times on Wednesday nights, that's when they have prayer meeting. You go to prayer meeting. It's just like a hospital report or a sickness report. Everybody's talking about all their ailments. Oh, and so sick, and he's got the flu, and this and that. And it's, 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 um, but God may be using that. We pray for their healing, but God may be using that to bring them closer to himself or, or praying for a new job. Well, maybe God doesn't want you to have that promotion. Maybe God has other things or another company. And I don't know. Just thank you, trying to think through this. Uh, it's, it's hard, you know, it's, um, it, it's dizzying to try and think our way into what God wants for us. Like, we're like, come on, God, like, give me a sign. Like, tell me, tell me what, just tell me what to do and I'll do it. <laughs> um, but it's not that easy, right? It's, he doesn't want us. He doesn't want to give us the answer, even though he kind of has given us the answer, like, as far as, you know, the fathers of the church throughout the year, the fathers and mothers of the church throughout the year, the years, um, and, and, you know, the teachings of the church and, and these spiritual people like Elder Thaddeus uh, telling us, giving us the recipe for how to 
how to pray and how to, you know, come closer to God. And, um, but we still, even he even says it here. I mean, we still struggle. We have the recipe, we have like the instructions of what we need to do, but it's still the most difficult thing we will ever do in our lives. Um, and it, it, like he says, uh, in, you know, whatever number I was in, I can't remember now. It, it, you know, it takes an entire lifetime to learn these things. So I wouldn't be, I wouldn't, if I were you, I, I, you know, I wouldn't go into any kind of despair over, over your prayer life. I understand your, your kind of confusion and frustration a little bit because I go through it too. You know, many times I pray and I feel selfish afterwards for praying for certain things. Um, You know, how many of us, when we were in school, prayed for, you know, I hope I, God help me do well on the test tomorrow. And now what that test, like, what does it have to do with my salvation? What does it have to do? You know, of course it like, it'll lead me down the road to college and so on and so forth or whatever. But, you know, I think God understands that we're going to pray for those things. You know, it's written in our, you know, in our humanity for us to want to pray for these things. And, you know, Elder Thaddeus talks about how, you know, our earthly parents, you know, like he says, like, they love us, but, you know, they, they will also like uh, forsake us if they get mad at us or something. Um, But we still pray for them. And we still, you know, they still like lead us to our salvation uh, by being our parents and we still honor them. Right. Um, So it's, it's hard to find this right balance of, like you said, Thanksgiving and, um, and praise and all these different things, but also working in what we're struggling with because we're also called to give those things to God. Um, and they may feel selfish sometimes, but if, if you're struggling with it, you know, offer it to God. If God deems it as a true struggle and something that is going to help you get closer to him, yeah, then yeah, he's going to answer you and he's going to help you. Um, and of course, if it's not fruitful and if it's selfish, if it's, you know, I hope Joe gets fired tomorrow, God, please, you know, cause him to get fired. Uh, you know, obviously God's not going to do something like that and, and <laughs> like let's entertain something like that, but perhaps he's going to make, Joe more present in our lives so that we can learn how to love Joe instead of pray for his destruction. Um, and that's how God works. You know, we try and plan, you know, there's that saying, God, we, uh, man plans and God laughs because God knows what's right for us. And if we pray for the right thing, then good on us. You know, God is happy. God rejoices. But if we pray for the wrong things, God is not going to punish us for that, but he's going to show us a different way and try and teach us how to change our ways and look within ourselves um, to better uh, pray for other people and to love our neighbor more. Uh, And that's just one example. But, you know, uh, I wouldn't, you know, and Elder Thaddeus tells us in the chapter on prayer to pray simply and pray like we're talking to our father. Um, And a lot of times, like, you know, if you're trying to find a balance in between those things, a lot of times what I do in my prayer rule is I read some prayers from a book. And after reading his chapter in this book about prayer and how we really need to focus on the words that we're saying and not just say them to say them and finish and like, you know, close the book and like, okay, I can move on to the next thing. I try and focus on the words now. Uh, and then, and then, you know, I have a, a portion of my prayer time that is just talking to God and saying, you know, God, this is Lord, this is what I'm struggling with. You know, if it is your will, please help me do this. Or if it is your will, you know, you just put, put things in those terms. And, and God knows, you know, even without us saying those things, like he says in this, God knows the thought before we have it. Um, And there's that, that section in this chapter where he says, you know, if we do something to say, Oh, I'll do this. And, and God, he, God will be happy. Um, no, he knows you're even thinking that like, there's nothing we can hide from God in our thoughts. Like we think we can hide and, you know, um, every thought we entertain in our mind, God knows. Uh, so, you know, just 
I don't know if you're asking for help, but, <laughs> but if you want to know what I, what I try and do to keep that balance, because I think about those things too, and I'm a priest. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you're not alone in, in, in those thoughts. And as a human being, that's just natural to, to be like, well, what am I supposed to do? Like, how am I supposed to pray? Am I doing it right? Yeah. Uh, so, you know, those are good things. And at least you're thinking about it. Yeah. Uh, well, it's just like, you, you may I've, just got, be... I've got, uh, you know, children in their twenties and, you know, and I, I pray that God just think about God, you know, the, you know, they're, they're in their, some of them are in college and, and graduated. But I'm like, you know, turn towards God, think about him during the day. Mm-hmm. But I mean, the, I pray for that, but that's, they have free will. That's a choice they have to make. I can't, I mean, I, I, I want them to turn towards God. I want them to have a closer relationship, but that's out of my control. And really it's out of God's because they, that's something, I mean, I think once they turn God, you know, will speak to them and embrace them, but it, it's like, they've got to, you know, they've got to make that choice. And that's where I guess the struggle is because, you know, I pray for them to be close to God, but you know, that's, that's a decision they have got to make for themselves. I can't make it for them. And so anyway, that's, that's uh, true. Uh, well, that's a, but that's an excellent point. And, and thank you. I'm really glad you brought that up because, you know, it's good. Our people need to hear that. And, you know, maybe we, if there's, you know, only a few of us, 14 of us on this call, you know, maybe that's something, some kind of open discussion we need to have on a larger scale within our parish so that people understand, you know, I think that's a lot of people's question about prayer. Father. Jerry. Uh, yeah. Can I offer uh, a book recommendation? Sure. Um, and it may be something that you may want to use for your point for one of our sessions going forward, the uh, spiritual council. It's in the bookstore, I think. Unless I bought the last remaining copies of it by Father John, uh, Saint, he's now St. John, uh, Kronstadt. And a third of it is devoted to just prayer. The first third of the book is just all prayer, all things that we're talking about tonight. And I think it's an amazing book. But uh, that would be a great discussion book. Bob. That would, absolutely. Maybe we can do something like that. I mean, we can talk about prayer endlessly. Yeah. Uh, and it's, there's so much to it, you know, and it's, it's so involved. So, um, well, I thank you for bringing up that point. I don't want to keep everyone too late. I know it's, it's right around eight o'clock now. So, uh, if there's anything, you know, that we didn't get to discuss tonight that you'd like to bring next week, uh, I'll probably open up that way next week, just in case we missed anything. Um, but, uh, thanks. Thank you all once again for joining us and, and I pray that you all have a peaceful evening. And we'll just, uh, we'll just end with uh, through the prayers of our Holy Fathers. Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Uh, everyone go in peace. Thank you. Have in pieces. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Good night. Thank you, everyone.